And um, Jason has um, been making many contributions related to ethical questions surrounding um, healthcare decisions, cognitive impairment, dementia, clinical trials, and I could go on um, even longer, but as a side issue, I'll put in a very small plug. Um, Jason also wrote um, a very interesting book entitled Open Wound, The Tragic Obsession of Dr. William Beaumont, based on the interesting relationship between a physician researcher and um, a perhaps unfortunate but curious um, patient, and I'd encourage people who are curious to um, check this out. Um, anyway, it's a great pleasure um, to have Jason come and talk to us um, with regard to ethical concerns as we are entering an era of preclinical biomarker intervention studies. Oh, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mary Sons Mo and your colleagues at UCSD for inviting me. It's really a pleasure, and I, uh, uh, I understand the amount of work it takes to get one of these things organized, so I, I have my applause for you for doing that. I also want to thank U.S. Airways for eventually getting me here. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a, a, bit of a journey, um, but here I am. Uh, I do want to remark, too, before I go into my talk, it was a real, I was touched when I was looking at the program uh, preparing uh, to see the uh, the lectureship in the honor of Leon Thal. I have very fond memories of Leon. Uh, I know he means a lot to you all here. Um, I keep uh, a copy of the program from his memorial service in my office. I see it every day. Um, and it was, I was so touched to see that uh, memorial lecture. Uh, he was a very, very special person, a very important person in the Alzheimer's field. And, uh, and uh, he is certainly someone that uh, we miss. Today, I want to talk to you about ethical concerns related to preclinical biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and prevention trials. And I know that for an audience uh, that uh, is not engaged in research, um, you may say, well, why do I need to know about this? Um, this is, does not inform my day-to-day -day clinical practice. And to the extent that that's one of your goals, I suppose you can give me a one on that or whatever the low ranking is. <laughs> How well did this talk contribute to going back and taking care of patients? Having said that, I would hope that you take from my talk um, that looking at what is going on in the world of preclinical Alzheimer's disease now is a way to begin to think about how the language of what we talk about when we talk about Alzheimer's disease is changing, and that those studies um, are actually studies who has, that serve multiple purposes. There's no question, for example, that a clinical trial uh, is designed to test whether an intervention works, whether it makes people better or not so sick, et cetera. But one other role of a clinical trial is to validate language, is to say that certain words and terms, or in the language of science, certain ways of measuring things are correct, that they speak correctly to the way the world is. And um, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, my own experience as an intern uh, in uh, internal medicine. Uh, I remember early on in my internship seeing a patient in my outpatient practice who was an elderly gentleman, and his systolic blood pressure was, say, 165 or 70. And I remember I went back to my preceptor, Dr. Fingerhood, and presented the patient. And I remember in that Socratic way that doctors have to educate each other. He said, what do you want to do about that elevated blood pressure? And my response was nothing, because that reflects the age-related changes seen in the cardiovascular system in compensating for the lack of, of um, elasticity in the aging vascular system. And he said, that's exactly right. And off that gentleman went. One year later, the SHEP trial, the systolic hypertension in elderly persons trial, showed that gentlemen just like him who were given a thiazide or a beta blocker compared to placebo were less likely to have heart failure or a stroke. And therefore, what we talked about as normal age-related changes in the vascular tree became then the disease of systolic hypertension in elderly persons. And of course, I think the rest is history. I give you that anecdote below the neck, if you will, to say that the now, in the world of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, we are entering into that kind of set of experiments where we're beginning to test what we thought was normal, 
we're not sure what it means, uh, uh, measures of, of before someone's sick, and we may transform them into ways of talking about Alzheimer's. And so that's why I think paying attention to this topic is valuable. So the, at the here and now, right now, when people like Dr. Glasgow and myself and Dr. Azen and others uh, think about uh, uh, AD biomarkers, the question that is before us is, is it ethical to tell someone who wants to join an AD biomarker-driven study in cognitively normal persons? Is it ethical to tell them the result of a test uh, that determines that they um, are eligible to be in that clinical trial? say, for example, an amyloid PET scan, um, but that that test itself doesn't have any clinical value. And so <clears throat> the, the problem, of course, is that in research, we don't tell our research participants the results of all the various research data that doesn't have any clinical meaning, right? We don't. We don't tell them things that we don't know what they mean because we don't know what they mean. Um, so that's the dilemma we have when we conduct trials in the preclinical space, which is, well, if you're in this study because you have elevated amyloid on a PET scan, should we tell you that? Because we're not sure really what it means yet in a cognitively normal person, very different in the case of someone who's demented where the amyloid scan can help sort out the differential diagnosis. So how do we uh, uh, go about conducting those studies? Do we have to design them in ways that we don't tell people the result? Um, or should we, can we design them in ways where we do tell them the result? And the argument I want to make here is that it actually is ethical to tell people um, their preclinical AD biomarker result. I think it is ethical, and it's ethical under a very tightly uh, uh, argued set of considerations. It's ethical if the study will contribute to the biomarker's validity and clinical value. That this study's results will uh, validate the hypothesis and that that hypothesis will translate the biomarker into clinical practice. If that's the case, then you have an argument to say that as part of the study, you should be telling people their AD biomarker result. And the, the thought question I have there uh, at the bottom bullet is, does the study follow a logic of clinical purpose? And this is a term that was coined by the philosopher uh, uh, Benjamin Friedman several years ago to describe a way to justify the design of a clinical trial and in particular, he was addressing the challenge of whether or not to use a placebo control in a clinical trial. And Benjamin Friedman argued that a, the selection of the control group in a clinical trial should follow the logic of clinical purpose. We should compare the new treatment to the thing that we're currently using so that the study adds to and responds to clinical practice. And so his argument was to the extent that clinical practice doesn't have a clear therapy, then placebo is appropriate. To the extent that clinical practice has a clear therapy, placebo would be inappropriate. Now, I have no intention for the remainder of my remarks to wade into the debate about whether placebo controls are appropriate or not. But Benjamin's point was that the purpose of clinical trials is to say what is the current language in the way we think about treating patients and how well does this trial respond to that language and propose to change it. It's the revolutionary nature of clinical trials. And so in the case of eligibility criteria for preclinical trials, such as biomarkers of AD, there's a logic to want to tell people that result, I will argue, because that you want to know how, what people do and how they respond to learning that result. That's my premise, my argument. I would also, I do also recognize that there are what I call secondary considerations to support the need to disclose a biomarker result. You can design a clinical trial that allows you not to tell people their biomarker result. And the, the, the way you can do it is you can have an arm of the trial, a third arm, that enrolls individuals who are not biomarker positive, who don't have the marker of a question, and they are by default assigned to placebo, of course in a blinded way, they don't know that. And that third arm is a way to say that, therefore, people who come in, get their test, and then get enrolled in the trial to drug or placebo, if they're bio randomly, if they have the biomarker, or automatically to placebo, but none of them know it. You hope someone does, by the way, so they do the trial. Um, and then you could wrap up your study. And this model is used in the autosomal dominant uh, uh, clinical trial, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, gene mutation clinical trials. And that comes out of a community consensus 
that individuals from families that carry the mutation, such as the pre mutation, do not want to know that they have that mutation. And so that third arm approach is a way to avoid telling them that result. Of course, once you do design the study that way and you sort of tell people that design, if you get into the study, it does give you some better pre-estimate as to what you might, your chance of being a carrier are, right? Because I'm in the study, you know, and I know what the study's design is that there's a certain proportion of people who are assigned to placebo only, although you don't know that. Um, the one problem with that design uh, is, of course, there's many more people who don't have the gene than that do, for example. And so you rapidly would fill up that third arm. And so you have to develop a very sophisticated way to kind of tr trickle people in so that the act of saying you're not eligible for my clinical trial doesn't effectively become disclosure that you don't have the gene and vice versa. It can be done, but it's a challenge. And it is being done in the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative trial in uh, Medellin, Colombia, that enrolls individuals with pre mutations. And as, as I'm sure uh, Dr. Bateman talked about earlier, in the Diane study as well, which also is enrolling individuals. I think that non-disclosure in those cases doesn't, uh, may neglect the logic of clinical purpose, but I'll respect and have to get my head a bit more, and I can see why, community standards of what we do and don't tell people, as is the case in genetics, which almost have a unique and privileged position, can, can trump. So I laid out sort of my conceptual logic here uh, of, of why I think actually in clinical trials in the preclinical space there's a warrant to tell people their biomarker result, to tell them that they have elevated amyloid or that they have tau. If we'll go there in trials eventually, for example. So what I want to do is walk through how do we, where are we at in the field to justify that and what it says about what we need to study. And what I'm going to do is first talk about the expert clinician perspectives on the validity and value of AD biomarkers. So in other words, if you go to the expert clinician community and ask them about the validity and value of AD biomarkers, what do we learn and does it inform the position I've argued conceptually? Next, I want to look at the patient perspective, and I call it potential patient. I'm not sure actually if someone with preclinical Alzheimer's, even if we validate the construct, is a patient. They would be for billing purposes, of course, but they're not suffering per se, although I'm going to argue and show you provocative data that maybe they will start suffering if we start diagnosing people with preclinical. And then I'm going to look at how current AD prevention trials are addressing the ethical challenges of biomarker disclosure. I'm going to focus in particular on the anti-amyloid and asymptomatic Alzheimer's trial being done right now by NIA and Eli Lilly in a cooperative partnership. And I know one of the sites, of course, is here at UCSD, and uh, you were one of the vanguard of enrolling in that trial. And then I'm going to just uh, do a bit of a side note on the last bullet to talk about some issues around uh, issues in law and privacy that surround the preclinical label, which I think are emerging and important to address in the coming years. All right. This is the result of a survey that I did with Melanie Shulman and Robert Green and others of, all, of ADNI investigators. So these are uh, uh, re Alzheimer's disease researchers engaged in the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging study, which is a multi-year uh, cohort study that uh, is following individuals with normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease dementia, assessed on a scheduled basis for a variety of clinical measures, such as cognition and mood, uh, and uh, a variety of biomarker measures. It's a cohort study, much like Framingham, et cetera, albeit not as uh, 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 representative as Framingham is, insofar as Framingham studies a population from a community. And it's been going on for a number of years. And um, one of the issues we realized was that as FDA was getting ready to approve Florbetapir, which is the amyloid imaging agent, uh, 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 for use in um, detecting amyloid in persons with cognitive impairment, that it presented ADNI an interesting question, which is, well, do we start telling people the results of their floor beta peer imaging scans. And so we thought, well, one way to get to that or to find out kind of what the, uh, 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 some information to inform that question is to talk to the ADNI investigators. And so we did a formal survey of them, which was published in Neurology last year. And what this slide depicts, <coughs> excuse me, is the answers uh, from those uh, 155 of the sub participants to the question, for each of the measures along the x-axis, whether you think it provides clinically meaningful information for individuals with 
Alzheimer's disease dementia. Okay? Alzheimer's disease dementia, that AD. And so we didn't define what clinically meaningful meant. And I remember in the survey, as we put it together, one colleague said, we have to tell them what that means. I said, if physicians can't figure out what clinically meaningful means, then that's not my problem. Uh, that's, that, that's, a, some, that's another issue. So, so what you see here is just simply on the y-axis is the percent. So of the 155 people, you know, what percent, what proportion, when asked, does the mini mental provide clinically meaningful information about people with Alzheimer's disease dementia, what percent said, yes, it does, okay? And what you can see there is, fortunately, I was pleased to see almost 90% thought that the mini mental provided clinically meaningful information to people about people with Alzheimer's disease dementia. And you can sort of march along there. There's the GDS right next to it. There's the CDR, which is a staging method for Alzheimer's disease. And then we move into some non, if you will, clinical interview-based things, such as an MRI looking at vascular lesions, an MRI looking at hippocampal volume and structure. And again, you see high proportions saying that it provides clinically meaningful information. FDG PET. And then we get to PIB and our fluorbetapyr imaging, amyloid imaging on a PET scan. And you know, look at that, about 80%, almost the same as all the others. So there's a sort of constancy here that it provides clinically meaningful information in people with AD dementia. I think that only makes sense. Okay, I, I get that. Well, we also then asked them, what about with people with MCI, and what about people with normal cognition? And so what, the next slide is going to show you what their views are about whether these measures provide clinically meaningful information to those people in those diagnostic categories, okay? And what I'd like you to think about is, those of you who work clinically in these areas, what do you think the answer is to those questions? In other words, and let me just focus on the blue. In individuals, older adults who are cognitively normal, do you think that um, a PIB and or fluorbetapyr and amyloid imaging scan provides clinically meaningful information? Now, I can tell you my answer to that question, I already see someone's head nodding no, was just what that individual in the audience is doing. I didn't think it provided clinically meaning. I would have said, no, it doesn't. But let's see what these experts say. Remember, these are researchers who are very much engaged in the vanguard of Alzheimer's disease diagnostics and therapeutics at leading academic medical centers throughout the United States of America. And here's the result. And I thought this was fascinating, that, that, the, the, that there's a co constancy here across all the measures of saying in, in normals that it provides clinically meaningful information. And, and in particular, the PIB fluorbetapyr you see the majority saying, I think it provides clinically meaningful information. I found that absolutely fascinating. So the field there be, sees these are people who live and breathe this, that that, that, that that biomarker measure may provide clinically meaningful information to someone who's cognitively normal. We then asked them, do you think if, if, if you were able to prescribe an, a, a, a amyloid imaging that um, you would support telling uh, uh, ADNI participants who have mild cognitive impairment the results of their amyloid imaging scan. So this is a bit of a provocative question, which is you've got people in ADNI with MCI, you have amyloid images in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the database, do you think you should tell them that result? And what you can see here is that the majority, about 80 percent or so, said, yeah, I support telling people that data. The next question, of course, was, well, what about normal people? And so again, what do you think? And I was imagine, you know, you're you know, you've got these, you've been following this cognitively normal individual for years, three, four, five years. I think, well, Adney actually has been going on for what, 80 years now? I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's a little study that will never end. Um, do you think they should know? And here you see 50% saying, I think that they should know. Now, the most important thing we asked them was, what concerns or questions or thoughts do you have about telling people this result? And that's really where I think we see we can put these just simple quantitative data into a larger context. And so what I'm going to show you next in the next two slides are people's answers to what they filled out, they wrote, they, well, they typed actually, and we quoted what they said. And I'll walk through all the sort of bullets that we took from the data. Well, they said, well, look, people in ADNI, um, if they want to know it, they should know it. Sort of a radical kind of autom uh, autonomy view. Um, I would submit that that's going to get you in a lot of trouble in research. ADNI participant characteristics should determine. Like I can, I, look, I think in general normal people shouldn't know it, but I can imagine some normals who might, I can see that they should know it because whatever it may be. Um, to, if you're going to tell people this result, there was a strong view amongst 
the investigators we surveyed, that you really need some way to do it, and we have no clue how to do it. In other words, we need some guidance about what you need to tell people and how to educate them. Um, we should recognize that if we do start telling people these results, that there could be real harms to them, but also benefits, which I'll talk more about in a minute, both the harms and benefits. We need to gather data if we start telling them about it. <clears throat> and this, to me, was one of the most important points, which led ultimately to a policy to not to disclose, but if you do, to record it, which is in a cohort study, if I tell people these results, it could affect both what I think about them, because I now know what their result is, and how I rate them, and how they rate themselves. So the bottom line is, I think these data suggest that amongst the expert uh, clinical community, I'm going the wrong way, amongst the expert clinical community, there's a general sense that these measures are almost ready to be told to people, but it needs to be told in almost a research context. We have to study what we're doing. We just don't want to start telling them the results. Okay, let me switch now to the perspective of potential patients. And uh, I like this slide uh, because it's a good example of the hair club for men. Uh, <laughs> on the upper left is Steven Pinker, one of the first humans to have his whole genome sequenced. And on the lower right is Craig Ventner, the venture capitalist biotech entrepreneur, who was also one of the first humans to have his human, whole human genome sequenced in the context of his company. Both of these gentlemen learned everything they could about their human genome. And, and you couldn't ask for two more smarter men to do that. I mean, they, these are very smart people, very informed about genetics. And what's interesting is that they differed in one thing. Steven Pinker said, I have enough existential dread in my life already that I don't want to know my APOE result. And Craig Ventner said, I'll know my APOE result. And in fact, he tells the world that he learned he was an E4 carrier, and now he's on a statin drug to reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And what I like about this is you have two very smart people. There's no issues here, but they don't know what they're getting involved in. They've been bamboozled. OK, these are smart, wealthy, white American males, with or without hair, who <laughs> know what they're doing, and they chose two very different uh, perspectives on learning this result. And I think it's very informative to what we have to think about when we go out and start recruiting people for our preclinical studies. The pre we have the Steven Pinkers. And we have the Craig Vendors. The New York Times, a couple of years ago, interviewed a family. And when Alwida Jimenez started forgetting things last year, her husband Edwin felt a shiver of dread. Her mother had developed Alzheimer's in her 50s. Could his wife, at age 61, have it too? He learned there was a new brain scan to diagnose the disease. This was amyloid imaging, is the brain scan in question, and nervously agreed to get her one, secretly hoping it would lay his fears to rest. In June, his wife became what her doctor says is the first private patient in Arizona to have the test. The scan was floridly positive, said the doctor. The Jimenezes have struggled ever since to deal with this devastating news. I was hoping the scan would be negative, he said. When I found it was positive, my heart sank. Um, for a, for a, for a uh, New York Times article, I must say there's a bit too many adverbs here, but I'll let that go. Um, the point being that, you know, the notion of learning an AD biomarker, much like an AD gene, for some can be devastating news, albeit this is a person who's symptomatic. Mrs. Jimenez, is, 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 sounds like based on the description, is not preclinical but clinical. All right. Well, there's been some study about the impact of telling cognitively normal people about risk of developing Alzheimer's. The, 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 the flagship study is the REVEAL study, Risk Evaluation in Alzheimer's Disease. Um, which uh, showed that if you tell cognitively normal, middle-aged, older adults, average age is about 50, what their APOE result is, these are individuals with a family history, but otherwise no evidence of cognitive impairment, that after they get that information, or don't, and then we look at comparatively uh, the impact on their life, you see a bit of an uptick in, a, in, 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 in sort of what's called the impact of events measure, which is a measure of worrying about the information you learned about, waking up thinking about it, not being able to get it off your mind, but otherwise you don't see an uptick in anxiety, depression. You don't see radical changes in behavior for, uh, except for the increased use of um, uh, 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 vitamins and other nutraceuticals to reduce risk of AD. And also we found in people who were E4 carriers greater who knew it, greater likelihood to purchase long-term care insurance. But they tolerated the information. Now, the, uh, so reveal suggests that you can, if you set up a process, tell people their AD risk, and they'll learn it, and they'll tolerate it, and they'll get on with their lives. Again, if you go find the Craig Ventners in the world, 
they'll tolerate the information. You just have to make sure you don't go test the Steven Pinkers, right? And Reveal did this by making sure that those who were anxious, depressed, or suicidal weren't told the data. They got education before and after learning the results. So it was not just a sort of, you want to learn your APOE, fine, pop on in, get me a tube of blood, wait about 10 minutes, I'll get you back. It was a very so set up process, very organized around the timing and content of what people were told. So I'd suggest, from an evidence perspective, that we can tell people the results of their AD biomarkers, cognitively normal people, and they could tolerate it. But of course, we have to remember that genes are not biomarkers. So my, I, I don't know what my APOE gene is, but whatever it is, I had it since my zygote first implanted in my mother's womb, and I will have it until I, until I die. Whereas biomarkers are more dynamic reflections of pathophysiology, and I think that is a very important point to think about when we think about telling people biomarker results versus gene results. So let's look at what we know about the participants' perspective on learning their AD biomarker result. This is a complicated flow diagram that is the result of our Alzheimer's Disease Center's recruitment effort to enroll people in the A4 clinical trial, so the anti-amyloid and asymptomatic Alzheimer's trial is starting up at Penn. Actually, we just screened our first two subjects, a couple, um, husband and wife, uh, uh, last week, and we'll see what their imaging shows. And uh, what we did was send out from our, to our database of, of people who we knew were cognitively normal 127 letters to recruit them. And I wanted to just walk you through the flow of, of if you go to a group of people and say, do you want to come in for a study visit, to, to learn about this study, what happens? So, the letter described the anti-amyloid and asymptomatic Alzheimer's trial, explained why we're doing it, and it invited them to a meeting at the University of Pennsylvania's Perelman Center uh, to uh, learn about the trial with Dr. Stephen Arnold, the PI, and answer any questions and uh, uh, get a copy of the consent form, et cetera. So this is essentially saying to a group of people who are part of our Alzheimer's Center as normal controls, research participants, being followed on an annual basis, very savvy to who we are and what we do, very Alzheimer's friendly group of people. If you send out a letter inviting them to a study visit, to learn about a study, excuse me, what happens? And so I think it's an interesting flow to look at. So what we see here is about a third just didn't reply. We didn't, they didn't call us, they didn't, they, we just, the letter was all lost in, this, in, in, in space. And we don't know. Maybe that third, like me, it's still in a stack of mail in their house that they'll get to eventually. Maybe they read it and threw it away. Um, and said, I can't believe they're even asking me to be in this. So we lost a third right there. So 88 replied, about two-thirds replied. And you can see there, of those who replied and said, thank you for your invite, either by email or telephone to us, okay, I got your letter, you can see about half of that group said, and I'd like to come and I'll be coming to your visit, to your, your information session. And another half said, I don't want to come. And if you go down the group that didn't want to come, we recorded sort of what we could remember, what they told us why they didn't want to come. And I think it's very interesting. I mean, so I'm on vacation, I'm, I'm interested, but I work, I, I can't commit to three years, uh, I, I, versus people like, um, I thought the letter was misleading and, and I don't like what you're doing, I can't, uh, I don't think I'm at risk for AD. So not all no's were people who didn't want to be in the study, there were some no's, well, I'd like to do it, but I can't make the commitment. So you get about 46%, you get a, a chunk who come and a bunch of them brought some friends, so the number went up a bit. And in the end, at the end of the talk, you got 44 people who showed up at this event, in a room like this, 44 people. And what you can see is we, at the end of the presentation, we had them fill out a, a, a form, how interested are you from one to five. And what we record there is, is that a, of those who filled out that form, about 30 people filled out the form, the majority, 31, said, I'd like to be in your study, uh, and then seven people either were not interested or were neutral. So uh, this is not, there's, there's a lot of, this is very naturalistic data to say if you start with 127 people, you're going to end up with about 31 people who say I'm interested, which is, and, and, they're, they're, and there's some of the no's who would have liked to have come and whatnot. So what this, what is the point of this, and I'm sorry I beat you over the head, that, that amongst a group of people aware of what we are, what is Alzheimer's motivated? They get our newsletter, they come to our events. In the end, there's definitely a chunk of people who would like to know more about a study that will tell them their biomarker uh, status and enroll them in a clinical trial, and there's a chunk who don't. Okay, well that's all good to do,
But if you start telling them the biomarker result, and the reveal study suggests we might find a way to do that, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but I think we need to be concerned about two issues, at least two issues, and I'll talk, walk through them now. First is, what might be the impact of learning your biomarker result on how you function in the world? And this is the result of a very provocative study published just this earlier this year in the American Journal of Psychiatry um, by David Solomon here, who you heard speak earlier at this conference at the UCSD, of the impact of learning your APOE result on how you perceive your cognitive abilities and how you perform on cognitive tests. And if you've already seen this, um, uh, I, I'm sorry to repeat it, but like I was always told in medical school, if something's really important, you hear it again and again. So here it is again. So this was not a random disclosure of APOE results like the REVEAL study. This was a case control study. Some learned their result and some didn't, and those who didn't know their APOE result were matched to those who did. So that has the problem of bias that comes from case control studies. Um, but it's a very provocative result, and the key thing is that the result so I'm going to show you are consistent across a variety of measures. And, and so what you've got there in the red are people who don't know their APOE gene result, and in the blue, people who do. And so it's very difficult to see. Uh, and I, oh, look at that. Uh, so these are E4 negatives, and these are E4 carriers, okay? And I think what you can see here is that if you learn that when you compare the uh, uh, I know my E4 result versus I don't know it in carries and non-carries, you see a different pattern here. Namely that the people who know they're an E4 carrier are performing and rating themselves worse on a meta-memory measure. Okay, in other words, they don't feel their memories as good as it has been. And, and the meta-memory measure measures a variety of cognitive, perception of cognitive abilities, your self-perception. Okay? And you do see a totally different pattern here in people who are E4 non-carriers who do or don't know it. It gets a little more di disturbing if you uh, go the wrong way. Sorry about this. <laughs> Namely, that pattern you see is holding up across other, the subscales of the metamemory question, the retrospective functioning, frequency of forgetting, and forgetting when reading. In other words, you see this consistent pattern that those who are carriers and know it versus those who are carriers but don't know it have a, have a performance that suggests that learning the result makes them feel their cognition is as good as it was. This is a disturbing finding. It's disturbing. It recapitulates, though, what's known, for example, in the educational psychology literature, that if there are groups who are told that they have a stereotype mad performance on education tests, and you tell them this is an achievement test, those people stereotypically do worse. This is very well described in African-American young men and women. That if you say this is an achievement test, they tend to do worse on the achievement test than if you, say, if you don't say it's an achievement test, even though it's the same test. It's a very disturbing finding that you create a threat to someone about how they should perceive their performance, and guess what? They don't do well. And here is performance on a memory test. And what you see here is that that same pattern is showing up, that, that people who are learning their E4 result versus those who don't know it for CARES are doing worse on the memory test. That's even more disturbing. Because then what you're doing is almost changing the natural history of the disease, right? That it's not just how people perceive themselves, but it's actually how they perform in the very thing that defines the disease. Namely, like even you start to worry about the primary endpoint of your studies to validate the disease construct, that you're affecting them by telling people their result. You're gauging what the social scientists call a looping effect. If I say to you something about you, it changes you so that it changes when I say to you next about yourself. The act of measurement changes the very thing you're measuring. It's a fascinating phenomenon that's described across social and culturally embedded phenomena, one of which, of course, is our brains in the world. Doing here. All right. So that would suggest we need to pay attention to the impact of learning preclinical results on your mood and on how you perceive your cognition and on how you perform on cognitive measures. I'm going to add one more thing, which is how you how the world feels about you and how you feel about yourself in the world. So hearkening back to the talk by my colleague earlier, Nicole, I'd like to now talk about stigma and Alzheimer's disease. So we did a study of uh, 900 adults using a web-based survey instrument, uh, selected population sample, to try and get a sense of what generates the stigma in Alzheimer's disease. And so this is different than people with Alzheimer's. This is the general public being asked questions about stigma in people with Alzheimer's. 
And when I think about the preclinical world, that's kind of what we're going to start to face, which is as people stand up and say, I've got Alzheimer's, how does the rest of the world start to feel about them? So what we did was we created nine conditions, and people were randomized to one of these conditions. And the conditions were described by a core description of a person with mild stage dementia lifted from the CDR. So we took the CDR's classic description and just revised it a bit. And then we varied what the label of the cause of that was and what the expected prognosis was based on treatment or no treatment. So for example, this individual uh, who you read the CDR description and they have Alzheimer's disease and, and the doctor says that with treatment it's expected these symptoms could improve versus this individual has traumatic brain injury, same, severe, same description, but the TBI is the label, but with treatment they could improve, versus no label. So we wanted to study, using a random assignment to one of each of these nine cells, what drives stigma. Is it the word Alzheimer's, hence we varied Alzheimer's versus TBI versus no label, traumatic brain injury versus no label. Is it that, or is it the prognosis? Is it the sense that things could get worse, stay the same, or get better? And we used a scale of stigma that's been developed uh, in uh, uh, Alzheimer's uh, as our measure. So it, we, I don't want to torture you, but it's got four different domains to look at stigma. Structural discrimination, do you think this person will be treated differently by other people? Um, uh, uh, cognitive attributions about the severity of the person's condition and negative aesthetic characteristics, like do you think that this person is dirty or unkept? Negative emotions about the person, do you feel pity or disgust for this person? And distancing, many of the things that were talked about in the previous talk about the experience of stigma. And here's what we found. Well, this is just a sample. And the bottom line is we weren't precise in getting it to be like the United States Census. It's a wee bit more educated of a sample that we have, okay? And, uh, 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 but the general ethnic and gender uh, uh, make up fit with the way the United States is. So this is a first peek at what just people in the U.S., adults over 18, think about stigma where obviously we're varying whether it's Alzheimer's or not. And here's what we found. It's a bit of a complicated slide, but the bottom line is this. The trajectory of cognitive impairment most drove stigma ratings. In other words, if you were assigned to conditions that said things are expected to get worse, you were much, you scored people worse on several measures of stigma that I just showed you. The label of AD versus TBI versus no label didn't matter. But thinking that things will get worse resulted in significantly higher levels of discrimination, pitying emotions, social distancing. In fact, the Alzheimer's label tended to make people ascribe less negative aesthetic attributes to the individual than uh, without the Alzheimer's label. So what do I take from these data? If the issue is, if the stigma in Alzheimer's in the general public is not so much where the person is now, and remember we showed them a description of a mild stage patient, mind you, but you know, that's half of Alzheimer's disease, right? Dementia, mild to moderate. That the issue that people dread and distance themselves from that person and other things is what's gonna happen in the future. And our, the next thing we need to look at, of course, is well, then what would that be like when that labels on someone who's preclinical, has many more years to go? They, they could be a setup for all the stigma because it's all about the future. That's why we worry about preclinical Alzheimer's disease. It's not that you're sick now, it's that you get sick in the future and we want to do something about it. So this is very concerning about if you start labeling people with AD biomarkers, what experience will they have in the world in terms of how people treat them and think about them? All right, if we're going to tell people their biomarker results, which I think we need to, because I hope we see that there's a need to figure out how we're going to translate them into clinical practice. We need to study how learning that affects your mood, your cognition, and stigma. This is the A4 studies schematic. This is that clinical trial that I think you've all heard about earlier. And what I just want to say is, so we've set up a process within this trial to make sure before you get your amyloid imaging, you know what you're getting involved in. And after you get your amyloid imaging, whether you are amyloid imaging elevated or not elevated, we are measuring mood, impact of events, depression, suicidality, anxiety. We are measuring perceived cognition, so we know it before and after imaging. And we're measuring cognition, obviously, so we can look at the impact of learning your result. We have a, a companion study called the Socrates study, the study of knowledge and reactions to amyloid testing, which is designed 
to interview 40 people who are amyloid elevated and 30 people who are not elevated over serial telephone interviews to find out how they deal with this information. We're going to talk to them about who do they tell, who do they not tell, and then go back and later on say, how are things going with those people you told me about who you told, doctor, friends, family. It'll be our first peek into what it's like to live with preclinical Alzheimer's. Because if you're in A4 as a study subject, you are the model of preclinical Alzheimer's of the future. You get a biomarker test, you find out you have it, and you go on a drug. Or you get a biomarker test, you find out you don't have it, and you're followed along. And so we're going to interview those groups to find out, well, who'd you talk to? What do you tell them? What do they say back to you? How do you cope with this information? Do you hide it? Or do you flaunt it? Or do you selectively disclose it? And what's been your experience? So Socrates is going to start up soon, uh, and it will add to our data about understanding living with this label. I want to wrap up in my last bit of time just with some issues around what I think are important issues around the law and this diagnosis. This is a busy table from a paper that came out earlier this year. Uh, Jolene Iris, who's a JD uh, researcher, a, 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 a lawyer uh, in bioethics research at the Cleveland Clinic and myself. And we reviewed the laws that are out there to protect people from discrimination on the basis of health and other related issues. And um, how well those laws protect people in employment and in health. And so on the x-axis, on, on the rows, you see the ADA, Americans with Disability Act, the Affordable Care Act, so it's also called Obamacare, and the Non-Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And what we then have is some columns around how well the laws protect people who have genetic markers for Alzheimer's and how well those laws protect people who have biomarker markers of Alzheimer's, in this case beta amyloid imaging. And I hope what you see here is that and it makes sense, there's about 20 years of progress in genetics, that there are laws out there and the laws do generally protect individuals who um, carry a genetic marker from discrimination um, in uh, employment and in health care. Now, the, uh, I don't want to beat the issue into the dirt, but I, I, my take on the ADA is that even though it's uncertain whether it protects someone with a gene that, at risk for Alzheimer's, I, I think that if you interpret the way the uh, EEOC has interpreted the ADA, it does protect someone. Um, the ACA hadn't yet rolled out, so that's why it's known. So now if you look at uh, beta amyloid markers, what I hope you can see is it's either uncertain or, uh, or pretty clear from our reading of the law and the, stat the statutes and the regulations that they don't protect people. And then if you look into the field of discrimination in life insurance, and long-term care insurance, the latter arguably being very important to people who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease, right? What you see, oops, is, is really no protection, both for genes and for biomarkers, which is, of course is disturbing because, of course, I think where Alzheimer's is going is slicing and dicing the disease into these substrata based on genetics and biomarkers or some combination. You know, are you an APOE carrier and are you elevated amyloid? Okay, you have this. Okay, you're a non-carrier, but you're amyloid. Okay, you're this category. You get the. So we have a big gap in our legal structure right now to protect individuals who say are 65 and working, but have elevated amyloid from discrimination in the workforce, from discrimination if they seek insurance, et cetera. And this is obviously something that as a society we have to start thinking about and talking about. And I'm confident that we will. But right now we're not ready, but A4 won't wrap up for a good four, three, four years, et cetera. So we have some time here to work on that. Uh, I want to thank a variety of funders, in particular the NIA and the Alzheimer's Association, which I forgot to list here, I'm sorry, uh, for their support to make the work I've talked to you about possible, particularly the Socrates study and the study of the amyloid image disclosure process in the A4 study. A variety of colleagues here are listed. I'm, I know I, for, I can already rec recognize some names I forgot, but it's, it's truly been a very collaborative effort here. Uh, Josh Grill spoke to you all yesterday. Unfortunately, I missed it, but he's been a, a great colleague and some others here as well. And I, that's my uh, email address if you want to drop me a little note. And I, I think uh, the Jumbotron is going to show some questions, but I'd be happy instead to take questions from the audience rather than torture you with my, my questions. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed the opportunity to speak to you.